Welcome, Red Ice members. Thank you very much for stopping by. We are talking with Lawrence Gardner, and we're talking about uh, many things. We've talked about some of the royal houses around Europe. We've talked about the originators of the or the origins, I guess, of, of bloodlines and so forth. And in this segment here, uh, I'd like to dive into a little bit more about uh, the Grail itself. Actually, this uh, Lawrence seems to be one of the main areas of your work. This seems to be kind of the central. Uh, main point, as it were, uh, that everything spawns out of, and we haven't really kind of addressed that at all so far. So, I mean, if, if you were to explain a little bit for us the, the I guess, your intrigue and, and what you consider to be kind of the importance of the Grail, it would be really nice to hear some of the background of that story, if you will. Yes, it, it's um, a bit of a multifaceted story, really, but um, the, the, the Grail, I mean, as you mentioned earlier, when you... Um, gave my website address, it is spelt in, in different ways in different countries. It's G-R-A-A-L, G-R-A-I-L in England, G-R-A-L, so it's Graal or it's Grail. It has a number of spellings. There's no particular way to define the word. Um, the earliest written reference to what has become the Holy Grail um, comes from a, a document from the 8th century, and it comes from the writings of a, 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 a scholar of that time. We don't quite know what, what he did, but, but apparently this guy had a vision and, and dreamt or, or believed or saw that, that Jesus was approaching him with a book. And this is the, the first reference to, to the word where the grail came from. And what he reported was that he was presented with this book and Jesus apparently said to him in this vision, here is the book of the Sangreal, here is the book of Descent. And so the two things come together, the word Sangreal and the word Descent. Mm. And he then went on to say how he learned from this book that he was descended from Jesus. So we have the beginnings of, of the two things. Now, the word Sangreal actually is uh, Provençal French from um, uh, medieval times. Um, as everybody who might have seen the Da Vinci Code movie or read the book will know, um, in French it means blood royal or royal blood. Yes. So we now have the other connotation. Here, here is the book of the Sangreal. Here's the book of the blood royal. Here is the book of descent. And so we're into a context of family lines. Now, the word sang real, as it's split into two in French, um, the second word began with the R, sang real, blood royal. Yes. Um, it began in its various usages in other countries to get split into different ways. And it became sang real instead of sang rail. Yes. And San Grail developed into Saint Grail. And in Britain, uh, you know, the word Saint trans or uh, San, as in San Francisco, same thing, Saint, um, became holy. So what we have is is this San Grail royal blood, which became Saint Grail, which in Britain became Holy Grail. Mm. So the root of the word Holy Grail is, is, is essentially the English root. And in other countries, the various spellings of, of what we call Holy Grail can mean Saint Grail or Blood Royal, whichever spelling is used in whatever country. So that's why there's a number of definitions. And it, it, it's quite interesting to look at the, the different covers on, on my book, Bloodline of the Holy Grail, because all of these things come to the fore. And you can see how the interpretations are different in, in each country. Yeah. Um, now, the, the symbolism of, of the Holy Grail for most people seems to be that of a chalice, a golden chalice. Yeah. Uh, that's the norm um, in terms of symbolism. Um, it's a chalice that supposedly or, or is said to contain or to have contained the blood of Jesus. Again, one is into uh, the, the area of, of dynasties and bloodlines. 
uh, because the, the concepts of the, the blood of Jesus were, was meant to be perpetual. It, it contains the perpetual blood of Jesus, um, i.e. it contains the, the generations. Um, uh, again, it's, it's the bloodline connotation. Mm. Uh, it's the second device mostly used historically to define or to give an image, a graphic of the Holy Grail, is a bunch of grapes. Uh, that's the one that comes generally as the most familiar after the chalice. And again, you know, the, the, the grape is very symbolic because from the grape comes wine. Yes. And the wine in the chalice, um, as we know, we're, we're within the, the Eucharist or, or the Church Communion or, or, or whatever, when one goes through that ceremony in, in the Church, whether in any form of, 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 of the Christian ceremony, we still have the same thing, the chalice with the wine. Uh, and so, in effect, um, what happened was that the church, in as much as that it, it sort of rallied itself against holy, the Holy Grail um, <coughs> history and mythology and whatever claimed that it was heretical, actually stole for its own use the, the, the most abiding symbol mm. of the Holy Grail, the right. chalice and the wine. Yeah. So <coughs> every every time one is, is going through this communion ceremony, one is going through a Holy Grail ceremony. <laughs> And it's it's a very ancient ceremony. I mean, one finds it in um, in in the Dead Sea Scrolls described when the, they described the Messianic banquet, which was an annual um, get together at Qumran um, in, in Judea. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the the Last Supper, you know, within the context of the Bible, was seemingly one one year's Messianic banquet, and it, it describes the, the banquet how the twelve counselors. Um, of Qumran, who sort of run the government of the place, would get together with the Messiah of Israel. And that wasn't necessarily Jesus. It was whoever was the Messiah of Israel at that time. Mm. And the ceremony is is described in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and it talks about who will break the bread and who will produce the wine, and nobody must touch either of them until the Messiah has given his word and whatever and lifted the cup. Um, and that, when one traces it back, goes way, way back into time. And, and, and if one gets into the Old Testament and, and into the book of Genesis, even, and, and looks at the story of Abraham after the battle, Abraham led an army against a consortium of kings and sort of won this battle of kings, as it's called in, in Genesis uh, 14. Mm. And um, after the battle, the priest, uh, high priest of Jerusalem, uh, Melchizedek, right. presented... Jesus with the bread and the wine, the, the ceremony of, of, of the high priests and, and, and the kings of the era. So it's, it's a very, very old tradition. And, and in terms of the chalice and, and the wine, uh, the chalice and the bread, uh, because bread come, comes into the thing as well, as it does in modern communion, you know, you've got bread and you've got the wine. Yeah, yeah. It goes way back to then and, and possibly much earlier. And, and these seem to be the two ancient symbols of what were called the priest kings uh, at a time when the kings were priests and the high priests were also kings. Ah. And um, so it's a very, very old tradition. And, and again, that, that puts it in the context of being dynastic and of being about kingly bloodlines. So, so that, and um, hmm. there it still is today. I mean, it's an amazingly ancient tradition. And every week, every, you know, there it is performed yet again with, with the local vicar in charge. And yeah. I bet even he doesn't have a clue what he's really doing, <laughs> where this ceremony comes from. Right, right. So, I mean, again, we hear, we hear this story of, we talk about the Eucharist, we hear about the, the body of Christ and the blood of Christ. And that's what, you know, we, uh, we take in, so to speak. And, 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 uh, uh, but do you know, do you think that there's another more ancient, I mean, I've heard Joseph Campbell, for instance, talk about the, a more ancient connection to the mythology around that, that idea, so to speak. But do you put anything more of value to it than that as a symbol? What does it represent uh, to, to you, Lawrence? I, the earliest, earliest record I can find of it um, symbolically, um, and I'm still not absolutely sure whether it is about the same thing, but, but there are very ancient Mesopotamian documents coming from about 2,500 BC, um, wherein is used the word Graal. It, it's spelled G-A, G-R-A with a hyphen A-L. Mm-hmm. And... I mean, it's it's not written that way in ancient Mesopotamia. It's written in cuneiform text, of course. You know, sure. This sort of strange trumpet-shaped triangular writing that they had at the time. But the way that it's translated comes out with, with that spelling. And it seems to be the 
same the, the same connotation because it does apply to kingly lines. Um, what the definition is that comes from that is, is that this growl, whatever it was, is said to be the epitome of the nectar of supreme excellence. Mm. Now that's quite interesting because it it, it kind of defines it in some way or other that the, the priest kings of the era in some way were um, of this nectar of supreme excellence. And following that train of investigation and going down that track, uh, the most important fact that came out of it for me was that during that period, and in fact, for the longest time afterwards, right through all the dynasties of Egypt and, and, and way out into um, almost up to medieval times, you know, certainly through the Arthurian period and that sort of thing, was that the most important aspect of kingship and the dynasty and the bloodline was the female line and not the male line. Yeah, exactly. But, that struck me as kind of odd at the time because I thought, well, why is it then that we get a king from a king from a king from a king from a king and yes. the waters have forgotten? Yes. And well, actually, that seems to be simply the way our modern history is taught, and the way that things have been interpreted, and the way that registers have been kept in in recent times, and and, and a lot has been lost. Could, could it be, well, Lawrence? Look, so, sorry to interrupt you there, but could it be something to do that the more back in history we go? Uh, we go uh, the more of a matriarchal society. Yeah, ab but, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I found it intriguing. I decided that, that the easiest to look at in terms of reference was the Egyptian dynasties. Because, mm -hmm. you know, we've got 30 of those. And, and so I, I checked to, to find out why it was that um, the dynasties changed when they changed. Well, actually, what happened was that every dynasty changed when there was a king without a male heir. But right, what struck right. me is immediately interesting was following the female lines through this family. Because every time a new dynasty started, it began with a new pharaoh, a new king, who had married a daughter of the previous pharaoh's wife. Hmm. Now it seems that uh, going through those periods that the queens, uh, and you know, a pharaoh might have had a, a senior queen and a junior queen, and perhaps a queen for something else, it, they didn't have too many, but certainly two or three many of them, was that the queens weren't restricted to having their offspring simply by their husbands. Um, to perpetuate family lines, they could, for example, pick another royal line from another country and decide to, to try and have a, a son or a daughter by the king of that country. Mm. And, and, and that was um, an inspiration to me, because I, I hadn't realized this before, but, but one can find that, that when a new pharaoh of a new dynasty came to the fore because there wasn't a male heir, that his mother was the daughter um, of, of the previous queen who had had that particular um, daughter, let's say, by a, a king of Syria or something like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and so what they were doing all the time was expanding the bloodline, bringing in a bloodline from somewhere else and, and trying, I suppose, to improve it in some way. I mean, I don't know quite why they felt that that would be the case, but, mm -hmm. but certainly going back into Mesopotamia, certainly coming into um, Celtic Britain and, and France, the, you know, the Belgic countries, the same rules were applied right through until about the 6th or 7th century. And, and, and it might well be, I, I don't know, but because I couldn't trace everything, but it might be that that was continuing continuing right up to the donation of Constantine that we discussed earlier in 751. You know, maybe it was this sort of, not just the perpetuation of single bloodlines, but the amalgamation of bloodlines through the female line that, that was the getting in, in the way of the church and why they introduced this rule. Yeah. O only they could select kings in 